My guest today is the founder of Business World Rising, a leadership development firm dedicated to the advancement of high potential business women to senior leadership roles. Helping women ramp up their leadership game has been the most fulfilling aspect of her career. She is a sought after keynote speaker, a symposium producer, as well as an award-winning author of The Wow Factor Workplace, How to Create a Best Place to Work Culture and Heartfelt Leadership, which is her second book, How to Capture the Top Spot and Keep on Soaring. And currently she is working on her third book, Women on Top, What's Keeping You from Executive Leadership. During her 30-year career leading sales, global business operations, and professional services organizations within Fortune 500 technology companies, she gained a reputation as a passionate leader who, together with her teams, would always deliver wow results, especially in situations others believe to be impossible. She is a role model heartfelt leader. Welcome, Deb Bolkus. I got that right. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you, Jane. I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for the well, invitation. We're delighted to have you. And oh my gosh, I have a little bit of information here that I want to share with some more information that I want to share with our audience because you are a woman with amazing talents. I, I have to say, it just goes on. I'm going to say here that Deb. You, have beg you began a postgraduate career in high tech, attended UCLA as a math computer science major, and earned an associate of arts degree in fashion design from the Fashion Institute of Design Merchandising in Los Angeles. Going on to design swim and sportswear for apparel brands, including private label for Nordstrom's. Wow. Now, if that wasn't enough, you earned your bachelor's of science degree in business administration and an MBA in management information systems from the University of Rhode Island. Okay, now I'm just exhausted <laughs> thinking of all of those. That is magnificent. So here's my first question for you. What were the key triggers that shifted you from fashion to a top performer in Fortune 500 companies and then to entrepreneur and award-winning author. And now I know that could be a lifetime story, yeah. <laughs> but we'll, we'll maybe just condense, condense it to the personal sweet spots that you loved and moved into those different areas of your life. Sure. So very quickly, I, I started at UCLA as a math computer science major, uh, mainly because I was good in math in high school. I took calculus. To me, that was all a piece of cake. I just breezed through it and I thought, well, okay, I'll just go do that for my undergraduate degree. And uh, interestingly, on my first day uh, of my physics class as a freshman, I walked into this huge theater. There were 650 students in the room. I was a brand new freshman. I didn't see another woman in the room. Not one. Wow. <laughs> now, I'm sure there must have been one somewhere. <laughs> you. But, <laughs> I didn't see any. The room was so big I could hardly even see the blackboard back in the days when we had blackboards. Uh, after, after a while, I decided to um, change it up a bit and go into fashion design and do something that I thought would be really fun. At the time, I didn't really know what I would do with a math degree. I didn't want to be a PhD. I didn't want to be a professor. So I got a fashion degree. I, I loved the fashion business. My favorite thing was designing for wealthy women and doing mm -hmm. design specifically for them. Uh, and then I decided, and I went to work for a couple of different companies, as you mentioned. And through that, I decided I really wanted to run a company. And I thought, I don't know that I have the business background to run a, a fashion company. So I went back to school, got my undergraduate and got my MBA. So I was then ready to go to work running a company. And interestingly, my father was going to set me up in business uh, back East. And I was from California originally, went back East to go to school. And my dad was gonna set me up there and my husband just wasn't gonna have anything to do with following me around being a fashion designer. 
So, okay. <laughs> okay. So he wanted to go back to Southern California. Um, we went back and I ended up, I ended up taking a job with the phone company, which became AT&T. Uh, while I was in grad school, I worked at Raytheon, Raytheon Missile Systems Division. Talk about breath. I was uh, in, in the IT organization and programming at, at Raytheon. So I started down this technology industry path. And then I ended up not going back into the fashion industry. I ended up going into technology. And just one thing led to another. I loved it. I had a great career. And um, yeah, everything worked out fine. You just never know. There's some little thing that just shoots you in a different direction. And in that case, I got out of fashion because my husband didn't want to follow me. So I followed him to California, did something else. Wow. Well, that's, that's really fascinating. One of the things that you touched on there was something we've covered in with a few of our, our, our guest speakers, is that you moved into math at the beginning because you were good at it. Mm -hmm. And we often make that mistake. And I don't know necessarily if you want to call it a mistake, but it's something that we know we're good at something, but then as we get into it, or even we get a career, we, we start to think, I don't even enjoy this. Why am I doing it? But you fall into it because you're good at it. Yeah. So it's, it's an easy move. And then of course you made the shift because you realized early on that you were good at it, but it, it wasn't fulfilling you. So, and, that, and then you continued to move through your career and interestingly enough, ended up in technology. So that's, that's really interesting, the whole path. And whether you knew it or not at the time, you were actually tapping into your true self. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the interesting thing was when I got into technology, I was always, just driven to work with leading edge, leading edge technologies. Um, when I started with AT&T, I was working with Bell Laboratories. I was out in the field, I was in sales, but I was always working with them on the newest technology that they were developing in the labs. And so, you know, my, my interest as a fashion designer was, it was creative. It was creating something new, solving new and different problems. And that's just what I have done my entire career is designing new things. And, and after maybe 10 years in, uh, in the Fortune 100 world, I created virtually every job and every organization I ever ran. Wow. That is the way you said that, that you moved into your, the creative field. So you found a niche for yourself within the business realm. Yep. And I was going to say that because the fashion spoke to your creativity, but you were able to transform that into the business world. So you really have some talent there to be able to see the opportunity and take advantage of it. So yeah, uh, it, it's a great, great skill to have. And I found working in technology, technology changes so fast. Yeah. You're constantly redesigning yourself. You're constantly having to, to migrate your skills and build new skills all the time to stay current. It, fortunately, I thrive in those environments where, where it's constantly changing. So that just, yeah, that just feeds me. And then helping other people do the same thing and helping them thrive in those environments. Mm -hmm. Understanding not everybody is like me. Not everybody wants to do the kinds of things that I do, but I, I have also found very creatively is finding what other people love to do and where their passions are and how I can help them do those things. And it's almost like helping people become who they really want to be. And I find that just also terribly fulfilling. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask you, given that you had that burning passion within you, <clears throat> was there a difficult time when you made that decision to take a leap into entrepreneurship? Did you wrestle with that at all? Or was it an easy transition for you, given that you felt that you, you had found your calling in creativity? It, it was not an easy decision. Um, I was at a point in my career where I, about five years before I actually made the move, I became very, I don't know the right word, concerned, um, just surprised that I was often the only woman in the room when I was meeting with C-level executives with my clients. Uh, it, strangely enough, in the companies that I worked for, I never felt that anything was holding me back. The only thing that held me back at all was my own 
decision. Like when my husband said, I'm not following you. Okay, I'll follow you. I'll do something different. Um, so I would make those decisions, but I never felt that I was held back by anything. Yet, as I, at one point in my career, I was traveling around a lot across North America, Canada, US, Mexico, and I was dealing with CEOs and VPs of manufacturing and engineering. And because I was so often on, the only woman in the room, after so many meetings like that, you just start wondering, what's going on here? Because I, I haven't worked in companies where women couldn't be at the top, or at least in the C-suite, if not the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt where I had been, it was just a matter of time before women became the CEOs. I mean, my goodness, IBM has had a female CEO for the last several years. She just stepped down. She's now the chairman of the board. But I was surprised at how many companies I was meeting with and women were not in the senior ranks women if they made it to senior level were not in PL responsible positions you know maybe they were vp of hr or vp of marketing um, but not having p and l responsibility which is you really need to have that if you're going to run a company so, so it, was, it was almost planting the seed because you were noticing this discrepancy or this this di lack of diversity i guess and I'm hearing that, that that was something that was bothering you and also wondering, did you wonder if it may be women? Because you said you were never afraid. You, you, the only reason that you opportunities would come up in, and it was only because of your decision that you didn't take them. Did you wonder if it was women or were you wondering if it was the corporate world or you, that's, that's sort of what led you to to becoming an entrepreneur then. Yeah, really, that, that is truly what led me to be there. I, I had been in the business world for 25, 30 years when I finally decided, okay, I, I, have, to, I have to know, I, I have to do something. And I think it's time for me to, to make a shift and I wanna figure out this problem and see if there's something I can do about it. And interestingly, I was in Southern California at the time and as I was starting this business, I was talking to venture capitalists about seed money and blah, blah, blah. And the first question they ask you is, what's your exit strategy? How are you getting out of this business? And I'm like, well, I am just starting this business. But they want to know how are they going to get their money back? And so what is my exit strategy? How am I going to grow and churn this and flip it and do something else? And I thought, no, I, this is not one of those flipping businesses. I will consider myself successful when I can do myself out of business because there's no need for me to help get women to the top anymore. Well, that didn't fly with venture capitalists at all. That is not what they are looking for. That, that is so interesting. That is incredible insight. Wow. So the men in general were looking for the payback the exit. They, they really didn't care. I mean, this is what I'm hearing anyway, and it might not be the case in every, every situation, but they weren't concerned about the growth or what you were providing or what you were serving. You know, they, they wanted to know what their exit strategy was or your exit strategy and what the bottom line was going to be. Yeah. I and mean, basically, wow. but that, that was the nature of who I was talking to about getting seed money. I mean, venture sure. capitalists put money into a business and they want to know, okay, if I put this much in, I'm going to get that much out and right. it's not going to be very long before I get my money back. So how are you going to pay me back? And tenfold, not just two or threefold, tenfold. Tenfold. Yeah. So yeah, that was a, that was a great learning experience for me as well. I was really happy to have the opportunity to go through that and, and learn that. But I was at a point in my life where I just, I wanted to do something completely different and I wanted to give back. I wanted to make a difference. Mm. And that's why I started the business that I did and I did it on my own. Good for you. Wow. Well, you're a lady that I could see what, that you would do it on your own. <laughs> There's nothing going to stop Deb. Look at Well, you. I shouldn't say I did it totally on my own. When I started, originally my company was called Business Women Rising. Okay. Today it's Business World Rising. But when we started, it was Business Women Rising, and I started with um, three other women who were senior leaders in their companies. Uh, they were very passionate about the idea that I had, and they wanted to be part of that. And then over time, I, I brought people on board to work with me and for me. So it's not like I just I didn't become a coach and that type of thing. I ran a business where I had other people who were working for me that did that. And then uh, right. it, it was probably the most fulfilling thing I've ever done.
Yeah. And I loved every day of my career, my whole life, but that was the best thing. And I'm, I'm still working on it. And I'm, I'm very excited to be writing this book that I'm writing right now, because this is really the, the culmination of what I've been trying to accomplish. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be another award-winning book. But so that leads me to my next question, in fact, because we were talking about different ways that we can inspire others and how fulfilling it was for you. You say, or how fulfilling it is for you. And you say that perfecting your leadership skills was due in part to tremendous role models. So mm. I'm curious, did you have mentors or role models along your journey? I did. I did. And you know, it's interesting when, when I went to um, MBA school, one of the things I learned in MBA school was when you get out in the real world, out in the corporate world, you need to look for mentors and sponsors. Mm. And so as soon as I had that first job out in a Fortune 100 company, that was one of the first things I did was start looking for, are there other women at mid-level, senior level? Here I am starting at entry level. Uh, so I started looking for women who were at least at mid-level. And in fact, I was just writing it today in a chapter in the book, um, this particular story. And this, this one of the few women who was there at mid-level management at the time was someone I, I did not want to be like her. Once I got to know her, I thought, I don't want to be like her, and I'm not sure I want her mentoring me. And so after that, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, most of my mentors and sponsors have been men. Um, however, I had one really special manager early who talked me out of being in systems engineering. She's the one that taught really got me to go into sales early in my career. And I mean, I thank God for her because she changed the traje trajectory of where I was heading in the business world. And then later in my career, I had a phenomenal female vice president who I reported to. She was amazing. And she, she made sure that I had every opportunity to be in front of the chairman of the board, to be in front of the CEO of the company. And this is a Fortune 150 company. I mean, if you don't have people like that who are helping you, watching for you, of course, you've got to help yourself. You've, you've got to give them a reason to want to do that because they're putting their own careers on the line to put you out there and, and be your sponsor. It's a two-way street, but it is so vitally important to find people who will coach you, mentor you, tell you when you're not living up to it or tell you, hey, you know, you need to tweak something. You really need to kind of change something. Um, but that's, it makes, it can make or break you. And I think even in the business world is the same way. Oh, I mean, yes. As an entrepreneur. So I'm curious, I know you're a real go-getter and you said that you, the minute you came out of MBA, you, you reached out to find mentors, sponsors. For someone who is a little bit not, is a little more introverted, how did, how did you do that? Did you, well, at during that time, you probably made phone calls, but how, how would you recommend that someone go looking for a mentor? You know, I actually, I would meet with people mm. or if I would have a question, I would just say, Hey, can I have coffee with you? Or could I meet you at your office at like 10 o'clock in the morning? I've got some questions and I'm new. <laughs> I mean, it's always great when you're new because people are always happy to talk to you. Right. And so, yeah, I just, I was never really a shy person. Um, it, it, you, you've got to do something like that. You've got to step up. But, you know, there's, there's somebody else who entered my life after I left the corporate world and while I was just getting into the entrepreneurial world. And she actually worked for a company that was a, uh, a human resources staffing kind of a company. But she had this wonderful thing that she taught me as brave as I am and as easy it is for me to go and talk to people and ask them questions, I have never really relished the thought of going to networking things where you don't know anybody, you're just walking into the room. And she says, you know, you've got to realize hardly anyone likes to do that. I mean, no matter, no matter who they are, no matter how brave, no matter how outgoing they are, hardly anyone likes to walk into a room where they don't know anyone and strike up a conversation and try to figure out how do I fit here? What do I have in common with these people? And she said, when you go into a room like that and you don't know anybody, tell yourself, this is your party. And all these people came here just to meet you. Oh, wow. I love that. And you need to welcome them and, and say, I am so glad you're here. 
I'm dying to know what brought you here today. That is a great lesson. I love that. This is my party and everyone's here to see me. Boy, does that ever shift your perspective. Absolutely. It's like, you know, you have this staff and they brought all these people in just to meet you and they're here. So if you can just put that in your head and, and act accordingly, I can't tell you how much people, people will appreciate you. And, and then they're your friends for life. Then they're giving you their business card. Then they want to have coffee with you later. They want to know you. You're easy to know. Yeah. Um, that's it was great. probably some of the best advice I ever had in my life. My, I, I, that's going to be one of our takeaways for sure. At least it's my takeaway. I just love that, that perspective. I mean, it's a mind shift. It, you totally go in and you, you, you would feel, I would feel happy. It's my party. <laughs> you know, but that's, that's wonderful advice. Thank you for sharing. So oh, yeah. on the same subject, what does a mentor or a role model's value stem from? I, I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of, you know, they've been there, done that. They, you know, they've made mistakes, so maybe they can help you not make the same mistakes, that sort of thing. Yeah, and hopefully a mentor is not going to tell you what to do. Mm. Um, but hopefully they have experienced some of the things you might be going through. The thing you need to realize is what you're going through is unique. It's never happened before. Mm -hmm. In this situation, with this set of people, with you in it. So no matter how somebody else has handled something that may be similar, it isn't the same. And so even as the mentor, you can't tell people, oh, I know what, here's what you need to do. You need to go blah, 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 blah. But you can say, hey, you know, when something like that happened to me, you know, and here were the similarities of the situation. Here was what was different. Here's what I did. And here's what worked. And here's what didn't. So okay. let's think about your situation and let's talk through that. How might that apply to you and, and how might you go forward with that? And then kind of talk through that and, you know, forcing the individual to think it through <laughs> and say, well, what if, and, and, you know, kind of role play a little bit. That's what my mentors did for me. And oh, they did role play. Do that's interesting. That's what I try to do with people that I mentor and it seems to work fairly well. Yeah because you said that you, you're not there to tell them what to do. You just guide them, so yeah. to speak. But yeah. the role playing is really interesting because that way we can sort of experience, it puts an experiential twist on, on uh, what it is maybe that you need to do and fall into. Yeah, and well, sometimes like we play devil's advocate. You know, okay. you, the mentor might play the role of the individual if they have to have a difficult conversation with someone, for example. Right, right. Uh, and, and, and that philosophy would be huge for an entrepreneur starting a new business, you know, building their team, um, going out and finding what supplies they need if they're doing, you know, a product. Um, even uh, if you're doing a service, where do you need to be visible, especially today, because there's so many marketing tools. Yeah. So mentorship is really high on the ladder of succeeding and like you said you went out immediately and found sponsors and, and and mentors so don't be afraid to do that basically no absolutely and you know i even used to tell folks that reported to me when i was in the corporate world i told people always be interviewing once you start playing this it's my party thing it gets a whole lot easier when you want to learn something, maybe you want to learn something about an industry that you're not really familiar with or learn something about the companies that are in this business. Um, look for people who are in that industry. And if you know somebody that knows that individual, ask that person who might be able to connect you and say, you know, I'd really like to talk to John Smith over at XYZ company. I'd like to pick his brain. I'd like to learn more about the industry. And, if you can have them make an introduction for you, say something good about you, then you're much more likely to have John Smith talk to you because you've been recommended. Yeah. And then you're not asking for a job. You're just saying, I want to learn more. And, and I know you're really, you've been in this industry for a long time. I hear you're one of the most knowledgeable people in the, in the industry. Well, they love to hear that. You know, anytime somebody tells you, hey, you're so knowledgeable. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, they're willing to talk to you and you can learn so much. And so, but I would even tell people that reported to me in my own company, uh, always be interviewing, go out and talk to people, have informational interview interviews in our industry and other industries and just open your mind. You'll, you'll learn new things you can bring back in. 
Well, right. I mean, it's interesting because curiosity is one of the major, um, I guess it is not tools, but one of the major things that is part of creativity, curiosity. And so go forward with a sense of curiosity because that's what I hear you're saying. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask your friends or your family or your associates if there's someone they know that, that might be able to help you. So referrals are, are very important in business. And of course, that doesn't stop just at that level. It, it continues on through business and life. Absolutely. I love that you uncovered that sense of curiosity. Uh, because if we can go with the mindset of curiosity and, and just not expect certain things, we just go with it, like you said, an open mind, then the sky's the limit. The sky's Absolutely. the limit. I mean, it's yeah. great if you've got people in your own family that you can go to, but it's, it's really great to be able to talk to people beyond your family and get a different perspective because you've probably heard their perspective before and, and you might even have your own self limitations based on what you know they're going to think about me because they already know me. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to go forward here and I want to know about the wow factor. All right. So how do we get to the wow factor? You mentioned a little bit there about leveraging your natural strengths and passion. So I don't want to uncover that. I want you to tell us, how do we find or discover our wow factor? Well, I'll tell you, it really ties so much back to what we were talking about in the very beginning of this conversation. And that is tying into people's passions, mm -hmm. your own passions, and other people's passions and then as a leader and you don't even have to be a leader you can be at the first line basic level do the best job you possibly can every day at what you're doing be the best you you can be and if the situation is causing you to not be the best you can be then maybe you shouldn't be in that situation <laughs> maybe you need to be in a different position so you need to be very self-aware and asking yourself those questions. And then as a leader, you need to be helping others do the same thing. And as mm -hmm. a leader, it's not your job to do all the work. It's your job to, to grow others, to build a team, build teams who thrive and they all help each other be the best that they can be. And they it creates synergy. Mm. So the leader has a lot to do with that. But as I say in the wow factor workplace, if you're working for somebody who doesn't do that for you, you can still do it for yourself and you can still do it for the people who are around you. And sometimes you can manage up and help that person above you be a better them. Mm. It works. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's great advice. I mean, you're right. Just go with your best self forward and entrepreneurship. You are your brand. So you want to bring your best self forward. And often in, when we're in a career, because of other issues, the outside environment, you know, it could be the company, it could be the group of individuals that you have to work with. We often forget that, you know, and, and I can see where it could shift your energy. But if you, if you bring it to the forefront of your mind to bring your best self forward, then things will change for you. Things Absolutely. Will change. Yeah. Something else that I always tell folks is you have to remember all the time that you're a role model. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, you're serving as a role model at home, in your community, at work. And we need to be cognizant of how am I appearing right now? Am, am I serving as the kind of role model I want to be viewed as? Am I a good role model or am I one of those? And I've had a few of these. I don't want to be that. <laughs> so, you know, I think if we're just a little more aware of the fact that we are role models, that helps us be the best we's that we can be. Yes, absolutely. That's that I, I didn't ever think of that, that every day that we walk and do what we do, we are a role model. But when you give yourself that title, again, it changes your mindset. It makes you aware, it makes you think, boy, what kind of role model do I want to be? In fact, that might be a good exercise for some individuals. What type of role model do you want to be? Yeah. Yeah. 
And sometimes it helps rather than looking at yourself, because sometimes it's difficult to evaluate you. If you can ask yourself, what would my role model do mm. in this situation? Now, there's commercials on TV. What would Mikey do? Or whatever. What would your role model do? And if you can think of that, then maybe that's what you should be doing. Oh, I like that. Turn it around. Mm -hmm. Make it the third person. Yes. It's your alter person. Your, I don't want to say ego because that, that's bad, but it's your, yes, that's, I love that. What would your, uh, what would a role model do in this case? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I, in your corporate training, I was reading that you used a, it was the Gallup Strength Finder assessment yeah. tool. And the yeah. reason I bring that up is because there are a lot of assessment tools out there. They are very good. But is that something that you would recommend that an entrepreneur do in order to help them discover their strengths and why? Yeah, actually, the, the book that they have, and you can, you can get it on Amazon. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to pay for a class. Uh, go to Amazon or go to Barnes & Noble or your local bookstore and buy the Strength Finder 2.0 book. Mm -hmm. And it defines 34 different strengths. And at the back of the book, there is a little code that you can rip out and take the exam online. Oh, okay. So this is something you can do by yourself. You don't need to be part of anything formal. It doesn't cost much. It's 20 bucks for the book. And then you will get a report back that will tell you your top five strengths and it will define them and that's in the book the book really is defining each one of these 34 strengths so it's not a book you would necessarily sit down and just read cover to cover you, you get the book to get your code <laughs> so you right right take the exam and then when you get your report back then look and assess yourself and it will tell you your strengths and you know any strength can also be a weakness if taken to an excess yes and what's amazing for women i think so many of us tend to minimize what we're really good at. We, we have been so preconditioned to think that to be really good at something, you've got to work really hard at it versus it's so natural to you. You don't even know you're doing it. It's just part of who you are. It's part of your core being. And when you can take that kind of a test and find out these are the things that you do really, really well, you probably do this. You don't even know you're doing this, this, this. Mm -hmm. And then, and it also can tell you when they've taken to an excess, it can appear this way. So, you know, make sure you're, you're cognizant. But to me, it was such a, a valuable tool for myself. And then when we had um, every woman who came into our program with uh, Business Women Rising and our Leadership Business Program, and we had different levels for first line managers all the way up to CEOs and everything in between. And we would have everybody in each group take the test and then we would, everybody would write on the wall, you know, where were you, what are your strengths? And you learn how to, you start to appreciate what your own strengths are, why you're so good at what you do. Are you really leveraging those things in the job that you have? Mm -hmm. And what are the things you don't do as well that you could go find people that do those things really, really well. And those are the people you should put on your team and put around you. So as an entrepreneur, it's really fabulous to help you figure out once you know what your strengths are, what other strengths do I need around me because I can't do well and why would I waste my time trying to shore up things that I'm not that good at when other people are just naturally great at it and they love doing those kinds of things. Yes, that's perfect. I mean, that was what I felt when I was reading the information um, that I think that a lot of people like to shy away from these assessment tools because they they feel that it might put them in peg them in a certain hole that they're not comfortable with but a lot of times like you said we're not aware of our strengths and when we're moving towards building a company even starting a company we might we might need those tools that help us break down who we are and it'll help us on our journey because like you said once you get into building your team and once you understand that you're really good at this, but not so good at that, then you can hire those individuals to help you move forward. So, yeah, 
uh, that's the feeling I got when you, I heard that you were using that particular, and there are a lot of other ones as well, but sure. yeah, but I, I was, that, that was the point I thought that you would make and you made it beautifully because I do think that they're very useful. So we shouldn't shy away from them. We should find one that resonates with us and use them to help us at least yeah, understand a little bit more about ourselves because we get so involved with day to day and business, career, family. We never have time to sit down and go, what am I good at? Because like you said, we take it for granted. You know, we're just doing what we do, but we don't understand, well, we're doing that really well. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, we but, tend to think of ourselves as, well, I'm really good at being an accountant. Mm -hmm. But that's, it's not the same as, I'm really good at how I relate to people, or I'm really good at the characteristics of who you are versus the job you do. I'm going to move on to our next question, which seems to be in the news a lot recently. And it's about the imposter syndrome. Can you unpack that for us? Sure. So the imposter syndrome is all about you find yourself taking jobs that are stretches for you and you feel like you don't really deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. That you're really not as, somebody's gonna find out you're really not as good as you think you need to be in this particular position. And I can appreciate that that happens to people who move into entrepreneurial roles, <laughs> especially if you're in a business that's not one you've been in quite like that before and you're doing something new. Um, the the uh, imposter syndrome is really when the interesting thing is you're, you force yourself to do something more and more difficult, stretching yourself. So you're, you're really actually going up the ladder. You're doing bigger and bigger things all the time. But the higher you go, the more you stretch yourself, the more concerned you get that you're going to be found out. And it's that lack of self-confidence in mm -hmm. yourself that you deserve to be there that um, causes you to not enjoy doing it versus if you can just step into it and go, you know, I'm as good as everybody else at this. Nobody could do this better than I can. I may not know what I'm doing or how to do it, but you know what? I can figure it out and I can figure it out just as well as anyone else. And then you can, then you can feel, okay, I can do this and feel good about it. So it's a mindset really of believing in yourself without, without taking on a big ego. Ah, okay. That's a biggie, but you're right. I, I mean, it's interesting because you said a lack of self-confidence and that's the first thing that popped into my mind. That was a lack of self-confidence. Uh, but then what you just said is taking it on but without getting a big ego yeah is there any well, you know, and that? i think a lot of people the examples that i have read about and uh, there's one book in particular that really focuses on the imposter syndrome and they they name senior executives ceos of companies who even as the ceo of the company they have that imposter syndrome feeling because maybe they grew up on the wrong side of the tracks you know, all these other executives that they're with, they're really wealthy people. They came from wealthy families and I didn't. My mom was, a, my dad ran a gas station. My mom was a cleaning person. So I don't deserve to be here because I'm not in the same class with them. Mm. Or I don't deserve to be the CEO because I don't have an MBA. Or I don't deserve to be running this company because I never took a class in it. Or or because I'm Hispanic or I'm black or I'm not, I'm not what everybody else is. I'm different. And so I don't deserve to be here really. And somebody's going to figure that out eventually. Mm. That's the imposter syndrome. Okay. And in order to shift from that is to gain more self confidence. Right. Yeah. Nobody is born with all the knowledge in the world and you know, you can be born on the, the wealthiest family and not be as good as somebody who in fact probably won't be as good as somebody who had to pull them up themselves up from their bootstraps. Right, right. And sometimes it's not always knowledge. It's experience. I mean, you can have someone who's extremely knowledgeable, but they, they get stuck when it comes to connecting with people, 
with doing business because they're able to retain information, but that doesn't mean that they're able to share it or they're able to, you know, use it, that type of thing. So there's a lot of different elements that go into that imposter syndrome, but thank you for unpacking it because it's something that, that is, has been in the news recently and that a lot of people are talking about. So hopefully that has cleared it up a little bit and again, change mindset, move into self-confidence and let yourself know that, hey, nobody's born with every, all the knowledge in the world, like you said, and we all have to live and learn. That's right. And you don't have to cross every T and dot every I before you take something on. You, you learn it as you go. You just got to step into it and have confidence that you're going to figure it out. Yes. And, and, and believe in yourself that you deserve to be here just as much as anyone else. Absolutely. I love it. We're going to move on now to your books because I, I'm so excited about it. So I'd like to move on now to your books. And my first question is, what prompted you to write your first book? Oh, my first book, which is The Wow Factor Workplace, How to Create a Best Place to Work Culture. Wonderful, looks great. <laughs> the cover, I love the cover. Thank you. Well, actually, this is, we could call it the prequel, or the main book, and this is the sequel, or this is the main book, and that's the prequel. They go hand in hand, and when you read them, you will find out that uh, it, it, it truly is a series, although you can just read one and not the other, and mm -hmm. you will get, you'll get out of that book what you should be getting out of that book. Uh, and it started out as being a book. I only intended to write one book, and what really started it was we were talking earlier about being your best self and helping other people do the same. Well, while I was still working in the corporate world, I was invited to come and sit on an executive panel for a technology association meeting with executives from all over the area. And the subject was on passion and engagement. Mm. And I was asked to be there because I'm kind of known as a passionate person who loves to help people be passionate about what they do and drive an engagement in my own teams. Even this was before I became an entrepreneur. And so I was sitting on this panel with a CEO of a chain of restaurants and a woman who was a senior vice president of human resources for a major financial institution. And there were a few other people <clears throat> And I was very interested to hear what they were going to say about passion and engagement. And I was actually kind of surprised as I'm listening to them thinking, wow, we had, I, I'm not hearing things that would make me passionate and engaged if, if their work, but you know, those are interesting stories that they're telling. And then I talked and everybody had their say. And then it, towards the end, they opened it up to the audience and, and they let the audience ask questions to key individuals on the panel. And this one gentleman stood up and he pointed to the CEO of the restaurant chain and he, and he said, I understand what you're saying. I get it. I totally agree with what you, you said and talked to the VP of HR. I totally get it. And then he pointed at me and he said, so, so they lead with their heads, you know, it's all business. It's data driven. Da, 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 da. We all get that. But he says, you lead from your heart. And I think we can, all of us who are here know that there's no room for that in business. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting that at all. I'm like totally engaged and listening to your story and boom. Wow. Well, exactly. And so that is exactly what I'm thinking sitting there saying, well, what do I say to that? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Did, did the room go silent or what happened? Yes. I mean, everybody was like dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop in there. And I said, well, you know, that's interesting that you say that, but this is a discussion on passion and engagement. And I said, unlike these other people on the panel, I have a sales background and I come from sales. And I learned early on as a sales rep, people buy from people that they like. Yes. And people need to feel inspired and trust that you are going to help them and that they're going to have a successful outcome because of what you are doing with them and for them. 
And I said, it's not about manipulating the price. It's not about manipulating the numbers. I mean, you can lower your prices all day and some people are still not going to buy from you. And it's not but, about manipulating the person. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's about meeting people's needs and making them feel good about the decisions that they're making, making them feel like honored individuals. And when, when that passion is there on that end, the numbers will get made. They will figure out how they're going to justify that decision. But, and I said, leadership is absolutely the same thing. So if you don't understand that about driving passion and engagement, no matter what level you are, whether you're the CEO or a director or, or a non-manager, you, you need to understand passion and engagement is something you've got to be able to touch people's hearts. Now mm -hmm. you've got to use your head. It's not an either or proposition. You have to use your head to touch people's hearts. Mm -hmm. And it was that conversation, it was that panel discussion that actually made me so angry <laughs> that people thought that. How can you have a great place to work if people aren't passionate about what they do? You, your place will never be a great place to work if the people that are there aren't thrilled to be there and love every day. And in fact, love it so much that they would do it for free if they just had some way to pay the bills. That is a great story, Deb. That is so heartfelt. And now I'm curious, after you said, after you told everyone how you felt and why you felt, did anyone respond? Oh, right. you could just hear everybody go. <sighs> oh, good. So there, there was a little confusion. Now, you know, this, this was technology industry, so it's a lot of guys. There's not that many gals. And, you know, guys just don't talk about touchy-feely, heartfelt stuff all that often. Yeah, all. but some do. I mean, I, I would be shocked if there wasn't at least a handful of men who got it. I mean... You know, and particularly, you know who gets it are, one, if they're men with daughters, they understand that. Yeah. But two, men who have been in the military, they absolutely know... The, wow. only, the only leader you are going to follow is someone you know you love and you will do anything for them because they'll do anything for you and they're going to support you under the worst of circumstances. Because you know they care. Yes. Yes, that, that's really, yeah, the military. I could see that in the military. Yes, there's a, a famous quote by Theodore Roosevelt, which I love, and it goes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, actually it's Maya Angelou. You'll find it in the book. <laughs> but it's absolutely true. You, you've got, people need to think and know in their heart that you care about them. Yes, yes. And that they, whatever you say to them, it's because you've got their best interest at heart, in your own heart. Yeah, well I am so glad that that propelled you to write your book. <laughs> so there was a reason for that to happen. You know, when they say that there's always a reason for things, that was a reason for a I definite reason. If I hadn't been on that panel discussion, these books probably <laughs> Yeah, yes. and now, now you're just cranking them out. Like, I know you love to write because we talked earlier and you're just like, I love this. But anyway, I don't want to segue into that. I just wanted to first ask you, after that marvelous story, if you could, in a couple of sentences, summarize your books so that we can have, tell the audience uh, a little bit of the gems that are inside that. Sure. So The Wow Factor Workplace, which, as I said, it's, it, this all started out as one book, and then I had to break, break it down. And what we did with the first one, The Wow Factor Workplace, I decided, based on that conversation I had on that panel discussion, and knowing how some people are a little hesitant to hear about heartfelt anything, that we'll start without saying that. <laughs> okay. We'll start talking about having a great place to work culture, a best place to work, because guys in particular are competitive. They like to compete, and we are, and women are too, but guys in particular are competitive, and, and a lot of companies want to be winners of their official best place to work competitions on a city-by-city -city basis, and it's usually the business journal. You mm -hmm. probably have one there in, in Phoenix, a business journal, and, and your local city business journal will have the best place to work towards once a year. 
And so this is really about describing and defining what is a best place to work. Can you imagine what it's like to work in a place where people love it so much that they would never want to work for anybody else? They would never want to go anywhere. They would never even think about leaving. In fact, as I said earlier, if they had the money, they would work there for free. Mm. And the, I started with this because I thought there are an awful lot of people out there who don't like their jobs. Yeah. Don't love a what lot. they do. And yeah. they can't even imagine that there's any place anywhere that is a great place to work because they've never even seen one. So we take examples of companies that have won multiple best place to work awards year after year and they're voted by their own staffs and we found these leaders because the people who work for them said you got to talk to my boss i love our ceo we love working here and mm. and lo and behold when you find those leaders they're they're at the top of their industry and they stay at the top of their industry they're the most profitable in their industry yes. so this is really the introduction to what is a great place to work and what are those characteristics and what are the, some of the things that, that you find in these places to work and what makes them that way? And then we take it a bit further with this book, with Heartfelt Leadership, and we really get into the challenging situations that you deal with, you're going to deal with as a leader at any level, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have difficult people, difficult situations you've got to deal with. And so this gets into some of the more difficult situations and how do you handle them in a way that people are comfortable having those conversations and they're comfortable because they know you care about them and you're in it together mm. and together you're going to make this an even better place to work. So it's all about having a great place to work and it's all about having great leaders and being a great leader and how do you, what do you do to be the best leader that you know, people can have. And one of the ways to have, be the best leader for anyone is to ask them, <laughs> yeah. what does a great boss look like to you? Mm -hmm. What do I need to change to do that for you? Don't so what me. if you were going to be your own boss? If you're going to be your own boss and you're going to be working by yourself without any staff, I'll tell you, these are still great books and especially the Wow Factor Workplace because you're not going to have a company very long if you don't have really happy customers. Mm. And mm. It's, it's happy employees or you as a solopreneur, it's you being passionate about what you do and believing in what you do and believing in what you're doing for your customers, how much you can improve their life and not selling, but telling them, I can help you. Mm. Here's your problem. And this is what we can do for you. That they're going to believe that and love buying your product, no matter how much you charge. <laughs> right. So what I'm feeling from you, because I, I love it. Your energy is just jumping off the, <laughs> the zoom that screen is believe. If you believe in what you're doing, if you have passion for what you're doing in your heart, that will flow into the customers and they will feel that. Absolutely. So, it, you know, it, it's, yeah, because you, if, if you don't believe first in what you're doing, no one else is going to. But when you do, you know that it's coming from your heart and that's what's going to attract your customers and your clients. Yeah, and the thing is, you don't have to be the most outgoing person in the no. world. No, no. And in fact, one of the executives that we interview in both of these books and if, as he introduces himself, he says, I, I am shy. I am really a shy person. And I was always quiet. I, if I have to travel, you know, I'm on stage 40 times a year, but I'm the guy that I'd rather not be in the bar. I'd rather be having dinner by myself in my hotel room. That's just who I am. Yeah. But the thing is, he knows how to inspire the people around him and how to build relationships. And he talks about how he learned to build relationships from his dad by watching his father when he was a little boy and seeing how people related to his dad. And he always thought, gosh, you know, everybody loves my dad. People will pull me aside and say, your dad is such a nice guy. And he always thought, you know, if I could grow up and people would say that about me, I will be a success. To me, that's mm -hmm. success in life. A lot we learn by example. Yeah. yeah. 
definitely. So beyond these wonderful books, what else do you have to help people become more inspiring leaders? Is there something else that you're working on? Uh, yeah, so my next book, we mentioned a little bit, um, my number three book is actually the book that I wanted to write 10 years ago before I started down the path doing this, and then I, I did those first. But the next book is Women on Top, What's Keeping You from Executive Leadership. Mm. And we talk about all the things that keep us from getting what we really want, getting where we want to go, getting the things we know we deserve, and getting out of our own way. And acknowledging sometimes, you know, I, I would say for the most part, there's not as much bias in the world as women tend to say there is. Um, part of it is learning as a salesperson how to how you got to adapt. You've got to be the one who's flexible. You can't expect other people to change. You need to change. And when you're in a situation where you're just so completely uncomfortable, get the heck out of there. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's really about finding how, how do you do those things and identifying where am I holding myself back and how can I helping you get that confidence to step in there and just like in the other two books I am not only am I both of those books in this future book is weaving my own story I, I weave my own leadership lessons all the way through this but then I tie all the chapters together within each chapter interviewing other executives Mm. award-winning executive, highly profitable executives in a variety of different industries, men, women, whatever. With this one, they'll all be women executives who have reached the top spot in their businesses. But they're also women who happen to, if I was writing the Wow Factor workplace again, or if I was writing Heartfelt Leadership again, these women could easily be in those two books because they exemplify all of those things as well. Yeah. I... That sounds like a great book as well. So when is that coming? Well, hopefully it's going to come out the um, beginning, the first quarter of 2021. Okay. We'll look forward to it. Be sure and keep us in touch because okay. it sounds like a, a work in progress, but a fun work in progress, getting to know all these wonderful women who have made it and, but have done it with heart. <laughs> that's, that's really amazing. So I just have a couple of final questions for you. Uh, they're fun. We, I like to ask them of every guest. May put on your imagination hat a little bit. But here's the first. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? Oh my goodness. What would the title be? How to succeed without really trying. <laughs> That sounds great. I, I'd like to buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been written, so I'm stealing the title from somebody oh, okay. else, but I think, or maybe it was a movie or something oh. years ago. Okay. Um, yeah, so, that's the, kind of the, the whole part of what I'm writing about is how can you tap into to the things that, that you really are so you just are successful by being you. All right. Now, what name would you give your character in your epic story? Oh, hmm. Well, I'd probably name her Deb. <laughs> Bass, did you say? Deb. Oh, Deb. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Be who you are. <laughs> exactly. How would you characterize your epic life? My epic life? Well, you know, I have to say, I feel like I've lived my epic life. I have the most amazing husband, partner, friend, best friend, um, who talk about somebody who is the wind beneath your wings and who is mentor, sponsor. I actually met him at work. We've been married 30 years this year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice anniversary for us, but I, I met him at work and he so admired what I did and how I did it. He invited me to work on a very complex project with him. And I so admired him and he was so brilliant, yet such an amazingly down to earth guy. 
I loved working with him because we had very different skill sets that put together was perfect for what we needed to get done. And I trusted no matter what he said he was going to do, it got done and it got done beautifully and I never had to worry about it. So I guess you've heard commercials on TV about I love the product so much I bought the company. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> So we actually started working together and then we became very good friends and, and you know, one thing led to another and we ended up getting married. I never dreamed that because believe me, I had this whole thing that you'd never date anyone you work with. You do not mm, do that. It was really? Just, well, never say never. Never say never. <laughs> There's another book title there. Never say right. never. So you're living your epic life basically yeah. and i have years one later we are still very best friends we spend every minute together and people ask us oh my gosh how are you guys dealing with this COVID thing and being locked in your house you know a lot of people are going crazy being with their spouse i'm like we've been together every day for the almost 40 years <laughs> 35 it's no years different <laughs> it's no different we love being together still i mean we still go to the grocery store together every day we hardly do anything that we're apart yeah. oh that's wonderful that's really yeah. wonderful i have one more then okay if you had one epic superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, you know, my staff used to laugh because one of my, one of the last corporate jobs that I had, uh, I worked for a female vice president. And when I came into the company and took this position, she gave me a magic wand. Oh, I love it. <laughs> And she said, you're going to need this. <laughs> okay. And so I had that magic wand, believe it or not, I had that magic wand alongside a bullwhip. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> on my credenza. And the bullwhip was given to me in my very first job ever in my career by a woman who lived in Phoenix, by the way. She had, she had grown up in, in Phoenix as a sales rep and then moved out to the, the office I was Maybe in. Maybe that's how yeah. she got her clients to fly. <laughs> you know, I'm just yeah. Well, she said, you know, there's hardly that many women here and you gotta have this with you and let the guys know that you're not to be messed with. Right. So I, I had a bullwhip for a long time, just as a joke, because I mean, people just know I'm not a nasty person in any way. I'm not very easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't put up with crap. I do hold people accountable. But the best gift was that magic wand. So what would the magic wand do then? What would the power be? Well, sometimes things were just not going well. You know, for whatever reason, you couldn't make it going well. And I would often take it into a meeting. If I was in a meeting with um, senior executives and if things were getting a little dicey with some of the people, I'd pull out my magic wand and I'd say, okay, let's wave this. <laughs> <laughs> So so the light everybody up and they'd start working together. So the power is? A magic wand that magically transforms all the bad things that are going on and makes it happy and you live happily ever after. Okay. That's a lot of power. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> so where can people find you, Deb? And we will have all this information on your bio, so be sure and check out the speaker page. But tell our, tell our, our audience where they can find you. Okay, so my website, uh, you can actually get it two different ways. You can key in debbolkes.com, so my name, D-E-B-B-O-E-L-K-E-S.com, or my company name, which is businessworldrising.com. Either one of those will take you to my business website. I also have a second website, which I had the website way before I had this book, but the website is called Heartfelt Leadership. Mm. Mm -hmm. And in Heartfelt Leadership are a lot of short clips of the interviews that you're going to read in this book. They're very inspiring. There's a Be Inspired page on there. And if you're just down and you want to hear some good leadership news, get on there and listen to these people talking about the things that they learned in their life. And um, so Heartfelt Leadership or DebVolkus.com and you'll get to me and you can reach out to me. Just click on the contact page. And also I've got something new that I'm starting called Mentoring Moment Mondays. Uh, one oh, Monday yes, month. nice. That's a new project. I did see something come across my email. Yeah, that'll that be one great. Monday a month, uh, the fourth Monday uh, for one hour. And it's just kind of your time to pick my brain. Right. And I'll be happy to do some mentoring, coaching, sponsoring, answering questions, whatever I can do to help you do whatever it is that you want to do with your career and your business. Well, so if anyone is looking for a mentor and doesn't have one, here you go. Here's your opportunity to dial Deb up or check out her 
her new uh, page, I guess it is, or if that's going to be on your website? Yeah, Mentoring Moment Mondays is on the website. It's under the resources page, and you can just sign up. Or so, you can yeah. sign up for my newsletters, and I'll be, I send out a monthly newsletter, and so you'll have the information there as well. Okay, what a great opportunity. So I would love to thank you, Deb, for coming on the show and teaching us about women's leadership and the value of mentorship and all your wonderful stories, because I just... I, th I find that there's so much value in stories and people actually retain those. I'll be telling that story about you being a heartfelt leader and people, the gentleman standing up and saying, that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I just love there's that. There's no room for that in business. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And now Deb and I would love to hear from you. So go, go on over to my Facebook page and write a comment. Tell us what your epic takeaway was from this conversation. And remember, this is where you imagine, create, and build a life and business doing what you love. Until next time, this is the Epic Vision Zone. Thank you. Great.